gracious Heavenly Father, we just come into your presence by means of our Lord Jesus Christ and in the Holy Spirit. So very grateful and thankful for your word, for your Holy Spirit who guides us and directs us. I ask that you would filter out all foolishness, but just seal to our hearts that which is truth. For it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. We're studying together the fifth chapter of 2 Corinthians, verse by verse. And we were at about verse 3. It seems as though that the fifth chapter is not speaking simply of our physical body, as I pointed out in my last video, but of, of our existence here in light of the work that we have done for Jesus Christ. In 1 Corinthians, we were told that Paul had laid a foundation as a master carpenter and that we are to take heed, that is, be careful how we build upon that foundation. And the possibility exists that what you build may remain or it may not. In either case, you, of course, will be delivered so as by fire. And I suggested to you that our earthly tent, house, uh, tabernacle, uh, I translate that tent, house, is that building upon the foundation of the Lord Jesus Christ. It may or may not be dissolved uh, verse 1 begins, if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, that's a third class condition, uh, subjunctive mood, uh, the mood of uncertainty, it may or may not be dissolved. If that earthly tent is only the human body in which you uh, move, in, in which you exist, it will be dissolved. It will be dissolved. I believe that this chapter encompasses more than just the human body, uh, but in fact, it characterizes the activity of that body in the work of Jesus Christ. This is what I pointed out in the last video. Uh, I'm sure it was, I probably didn't do a very good job of that. The general conclusion, of course, in these verses is that this tent house here on earth is just the human body. You know, that would be the general conclusion of most Bible students. But it does not seem to me to fit the context of the chapter. However, if you believe that, it's that, that it's that, I'll be happy to forgive you. If you'll forgive me, for believing that it's more than just the body, that it's uh, in, in all actuality is the activity of that body as it concerns personal ministry and our building upon that foundation that was laid, our Lord Jesus Christ. And I don't know how to explain it any more straightforward than that. The subject of the fourth chapter was that we are pressured on every side, yet not cast down, distressed, but not in despair, pulled down, but, but not destroyed, always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus. We groan in this tent house, being burdened, that's a uh, that's being burdened. That's a passive voice. I am made to be burdened by some outside uh, agent. That would be God, in my opinion. Uh, that's what we studied in the fourth chapter. Constantly attending uh, to this ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ, folks, I think is that burdened, that being burdened. I suggest to you that it's because of that constant burdening in the, the truthful and the faithful ministry of the gospel of Jesus Christ that so many of his ministers are tempted to use shameful and deceitful tactics in order to avoid that kind of burden. In order to 
avoid the fact that many cannot hear. They can't. They can't hear. Now, uh, we can, of course, go go the easy road, take the easy road, and, and then the burdening disappears. That's why I believe very firmly that that which is highly popular here on earth is not of the Holy Spirit. Now, I agree he may work in the lives of some who are in that particular environment. In fact, I think he does that every day. But the true faithful ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ is one of being burdened. Uh, it's one of despair, of being rejected, of being cast down, and, and, and so forth. However, our desire in verse 4 is not that we would get out of this, to be delivered from it uh, in the sense that it, it, wouldn't, it, it wouldn't be that way anymore. but rather that this particular life that we now live might be swallowed up by the life that's articulated. The life. I believe that to be Jesus Christ. So that's the ultimate aim of our ministry, in my humble opinion. Our groaning is not that we wouldn't have this burden. I believe that the burden of the fourth verse is that my work would remain and not be burned up at Bama. If any man's work shall fail, he'll suffer loss, yet he himself shall be delivered so as by fire. And dearly beloved, there is great comfort in that. If my entire life, all of my ministry for Jesus Christ is wasted I still will be delivered so as by fire. That's, that is great comfort. On the other hand, that isn't really what I want. You know, and, and, and we say, ah, oh, you know, well, who cares about reward? You know, be reward enough if I can just make it to heaven. And, you know, and I really, I really wouldn't want anybody to think that I'm striving for a great reward, you know, or anything like that, you know. It's, it's reward enough just to know that I'm redeemed and, and that I'll be in heaven. You know, I, I'll, I can be, I'll, I'm happy to be the lowest person in heaven. You know, I'll, I'd be happy if I was just even the lowest person in heaven. And dearly beloved, what we're really saying is, it doesn't matter what the Lord wants. How can I stand before God and say, God, you know, your prize meant nothing to me. That, that didn't matter to me whether my work abided or whether it failed. I'm, I'm just glad to be here. I mean, I, I don't think that the fourth verse is saying, I don't want it all to be dissolved. My cry is not that I cease to be burdened. My cry is that this life built upon the foundation of the Lord Jesus Christ might be swallowed up in the life. I think the burden of the fourth verse is that my work remains. And if my entire life's work goes up in smoke... I'll suffer loss, but if it remains, I shall receive a reward. And it seems to me that the burden of the fourth verse is not to get out of the difficulty of life, but the burden is the great desire that what I do might be acceptable to the Lord. And take note of the fact that we have been accepted in the beloved, okay, positionally speaking. Look, if I might jump ahead, all right, and, I, and I don't want to jump ahead too much, but we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, 10th verse, that everyone may receive the things done in his body 
according to that which he's done, whether it be good or bad. Okay? Wherefore we labor, the ninth verse, that whether present or absent, we may be accepted of him. In 1 John 3, I read, and, and he who has this hope in him purifies himself even as he is pure. Is it possible that I could profess to be redeemed by the death of Jesus Christ in my place and have no desire to please him? Folks, I think that is more than possible. In fact, I think it's sort of common among Christians today. I believe that the burden I carry in this context of ministry is this work that God has laid upon me in the name of Jesus Christ, that it might be acceptable to him. Why should it be that I would just be happy if I just, if I just make it to heaven? You know, and that the goals of the Lord, the, the pleasing of the Lord means nothing to me. The ninth verse seems to me to me it seems to indicate that the, the product that we're talking about here is is labor. And we saw that God rewards us for our effort, not our production. God's the one who provides the increase. God causes the increase. And what does God require of a steward of a steward? Okay? We're told in 1 Corinthians. That, uh, that he be found faithful. And I think that's wonderful. You know, I, I am, how thrilled I am every time I read that, that he didn't require production. He's the vine, folks. We're the branches. The branch don't doesn't produce anything apart from the vine. I recognize that God has done everything for me, and he's even providing the increase. He's, he's given me the wonderful opportunity of yielding myself, surrendering myself to him to be faithful. I'm simply asking you to, to see the temporary dwelling more than just the body, but the body in its, in its sphere of activity of building upon the Lord Jesus Christ. However, our groaning is not, it is not to be free of this burden, you know, just to be home, just to be with the Lord, you know, where everything is, you know, is peaches and cream. That's not the point. We are not burdened to be delivered from the activity that the Lord has placed upon us, okay? We are burdened in the concern that that activity be one which is may not be swallowed up by life. We want that to be swallowed up by in life, in the life, not one which is dissolved when tested by fire. It looks as though God looks at our lives and ministry as a as a whole. You know, we want to list, you know, all of the acts, you know, all the everything, you know, as though we, we you know, in this, you know, to try to balance the good and the bad, you know, you know, what, what, what God will do is, is separate, you know, what he did through us from what he did through the flesh. That's what he'll do. It looks as though God looks at the life as a whole. What have you done? on the foundation of the Lord Jesus Christ. Did you build on, uh, upon that, that foundation? The sin question's been for, settled forever. We must all appear before the reward tribunal of the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay? Now, I know many Christians feel that we are here in a life of sorrow and travail and trouble and trials and tears and, and and soon that'll all pass away and we'll be in heaven with the Lord. 
and, and that of course is understandable and it's it's acceptable and it's, it has its place in our lives I believe you know but that is not the burden of this verse nor this paragraph the burden of this paragraph here is that what I'm doing here might in fact be acceptable of the Lord and by the time I get to the 10th verse we got a ways to go you know have the judgment rendered good if the judgments rendered bad that does not mean hell that doesn't mean that I'm cast cast away cast off cast cast aside it doesn't mean a anything like that at all but it may but it may be no reward none the text concerning Bama says that it is possible that is possible and that would go along with the thought of the third class condition of the first verse if it's dissolved maybe it will be maybe it won't because in first Corinthians 3 we were told that if any man's work fail he'll suffer loss and the fire is going to try every man's work of what sort it is. Wood, hay, stubble, gold, silver, precious stone. If the fire burns it, it's dissolved. Our burden is not to be unburdened. Not that we're tired of the work of Jesus Christ. And I understand we can get we get we can get weary, okay, of the labor. Not that we're tired of the environment and the activity in which God has placed us, but that in the sphere of all that activity, there might be an increase of God that remains. It might be swallowed up by the life. And I, and I, I take that as his life. And he that has wrought us, says the text, for that very same thing is God. And he's given us the earnest of the Spirit. A down payment. A down payment on what is guaranteed to come. And, and note just who it is that does the giving here. Okay? It's not us. No wonder Colossians says that we are complete in him. You know, an earnest is like a down payment where that, that in the, at least in the Greek mind, the rest had to be made. There's no getting out of that. And that's the way that the Holy Spirit wrote the earnest of the Spirit. Okay, that is God's guarantee that the rest is going to be there. But, you know, you see the primary shade uh of meaning of the verse that that I hear taught is that you know you have a hope of heaven which is guaranteed to you because God's given you the earnest of the Spirit so since you have the Holy Spirit you have the guarantee from God that you also have heaven's glory and dearly beloved dearly beloved I wouldn't take that truth away from you for anything in the world I think that's true I think that's true, but I don't think that it that that fits the context here. I believe the context is saying that the gift of the earnest of the Spirit is in the work that you are doing in the life which you are living as an ambassador for Christ. How does one believe on the Lord Jesus Christ? How does one believe on the Lord Jesus Christ? Because you can't cause anybody to believe anything. They either believe or they don't. I, I personally, I think pretty strongly that if you believe Jesus Christ is your own personal Lord and Savior, you're redeemed. I believe that. I believe that. I do not believe, nor does the, do the scriptures declare that if you believe Jesus Christ is your own personal Savior, you then will, in fact, be born again. 
There's no such person and there's no such thought in all of the Word of God. We're born again by the will of God, not the will of the flesh. But it's utterly amazing to sit back and watch the Holy Spirit work. You know, when we were born again, we received the earnest of the Spirit. There was a time where that we received the earnest of the Spirit. Dearly beloved, why do you believe God concerning anything? Okay? Because you listen to, to a radio uh, broadcast? Because you listen to Blessed Hope Forever? No. Because God commanded light to shine in your heart. Amazing the number of Christians who actually believe that they bring about change in a person's life or that they can command light to shine in a person's heart. I suppose one of the turning points in my life as a young Christian was when I argued with a guy until 4.30 in the morning about the Word of God. And boy, I had studied. I was as ready as a black belt in karate to meet any opponent. And this guy came along. He started with the flood. And it wasn't long until he realized that I actually kind of knew a little more about the flood than he did. So, so then he started with the ark, and it wasn't long before he, he realized that I knew a little more about the ark than he did. And we went from Genesis to Revelation that night. After three hours arguing, we're back at the flood. You know, I thought, you know, we had the flood question settled. And we started in on that one again. And we went all night long. 4.30 in the morning. We finally quit. And he said, well, I still think you're an idiot. And that was it. And I saw the guy about four or five years later. And what a tremendous change in his life. Just really a believer in Jesus Christ. And like a fool, like an asinine fool, I said to that man, what one thing did the Holy Spirit use that night that we argued to lead you to the knowledge of Jesus Christ? And he said, what, what night was that? I don't even remember that. I don't remember that argument. I said, I, I'm embarrassed. You know, I'm sorry. You know, let me let me rephrase the question. How did the Lord come to you with the knowledge that you were his child? Well, he said, you know, you know, I left and and, and I went to I went to such and in such city. And I, and I opened up an office, and I was walking down the street one day, and I was trying to, de to decide what in the world was, this, was the meaning of life, the sense in life. And, and I, I was making more money than I ever thought that I, I would make. And a piece, a piece of paper blew in front of me. I reached down, and, and I picked it up, and it said, For God so loved... And then it was all smeared with mud. And down here, you know, it said John 3, 16. And I said, I got home. I just wanted to know what the rest of that was. God so loved what? So I started going through my Bible. I finally found John 3, 16. And he said, that night, about midnight, I got down on my knees and I gave my life to Jesus Christ. Now, folks, I call that the earnest of the Spirit. I didn't throw that piece of paper at him. I wasn't even there. God didn't even use my argument with him that night. I mean, I might as well have, have just slept. Man doesn't even remember that he even talked to me. I actually heard of one guy one time who was actually born again on his commode. 
sitting on his commode. Folks, I don't want my life in my ministry to, to de degenerate to, to looking at what the world wants to look at. I'm talking about the world as an ecclesiastical system, a church system, and, and folks, it wants to look at experiences, okay? I could spend, uh, you know, the rest of the morning here telling you about unbelievable cases where it's the Holy Spirit that worked. And I think that the earnest of the Spirit is more than the testimony of His Spirit bearing witness with my Spirit that I am His child. But it's that we can see the Holy Spirit working in the lives and, and, and the activities of other people. Now, as, as far as the Word of God is, uh, goes, we don't need to make it effective. God makes it effective. His Word will accomplish. It shall accomplish that which He pleases. The Holy Spirit does that. All we have to do is be faithful ambassadors for Christ. And what does an ambassador do? He doesn't speak of himself. And who wrought us for this? God wrought us for this very same thing. What thing? That, that we go to heaven? Well, I'm, I'm sure that's true. But I believe in the context here, it seems to me that God has completely equipped us for a life of trouble, of distress, of persecution, of, and despair. That he's indicated that the life of the ambassador for Christ is the life of the de despised and the rejected one. Not, not, not the popular acceptance of the ecclesiastical system. Christ was not accepted by that system. It's the same identical system, by the way. And neither will you be. And he's completely wrought you for that. In addition to that, in addition to that, he's given you the earnest of the Spirit. Not only the testimony of the Spirit with your spirit that you are a child of God, but the activity of the Holy Spirit in doing the work of an ambassador of Christ. He's given you the earnest of the Spirit. Dearly beloved, I want you to see more in the earnest of the Spirit than just a testimony with your own heart, but in evidence of the power, the power of, of the Word of God. Now, I am not asking you to go looking for these things. That's, that is walking by sight. We don't walk by sight. We walk by faith. I'm saying that in a faithful performance of the, of the Word of God, you'll see them happen. You'll see them happen. It does happen. And as we see the Spirit work in through the Word in the lives of, of people, we rejoice, we more and more rejoice in, in working as an ambassador for Christ. And that's what the sixth verse, to me, that's what the sixth verse said. Therefore, we are, we are always courageous. The word is courageous. I would translate it courageous. It's, it's fair to tra translate it that way. Confident. Now, he says that twice. He says that twice. Verse 6 and verse 8. I assume that he says that twice because he, in, twice he said in the fourth chapter that we don't faint, that we don't become discouraged. And I find that interesting. And now, here is to me one of the marvelous words of the paragraph. Having come to know, my, my Bible says we are always confident knowing that while we, we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. I, 
I'll translate that. Therefore, we are always courageous, having come to know that while we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. It would seem that the Holy Spirit is willing to indicate that the maturity of that knowledge is part and parcel of the walk. It isn't something that happens instantaneous. It would seem that uh, the seventh verse or, or the sixth verse is saying that this courage and this confidence may or may not be the personal experience of every believer in Jesus Christ. You know, when it came to Israel uh, in the wilderness, they couldn't enter in because of unbelief. You know, and I, and I don't know, you know, how many millions of sermons, you know, have been preached that all of these Israelites redeemed, all those that God redeemed out of Egypt, all, all of them went to hell except J Joshua and Caleb. Amazing. I mean, um, how amazing how many people that we would damn to hell were we God. Doesn't say that. God did not say that. God doesn't say that they stepped out of redemption, but that they never entered into peace and rest because they did not believe God. Numbers 20.12 directly declares that Moses did not believe. Therefore, he did not enter into God's rest. And neither will you. If you don't believe. There remains, therefore, a rest for the people of God. Because the Lord Jesus Christ has completed my redemption, therefore, we are always courageous always confident because we've come to know we've come to know and that has to be walking by faith not sight we've come to know as we're going to see in the seventh verse that as long as we are here in this tent house this temporary dwelling in the body we are away from home in the Lord. I like to translate that. While we are at home in the body, we are away from home in the Lord. And of course, our, our ultimate home is with the Lord. And our desire in the fourth verse was that whatever we're building here, whatever we're building in this temporary dwelling, might in fact be swallowed up in the life. Not that it would be dissolved and done away. We have absolutely come to know that while we're at home here, we're away from home in the Lord. Folks, we have a home, no matter where we're at. And I think the contrast between a faith and a sight walk is we're not walking by what we're building here. You know, what we can see here. Which again emphasizes the fact that it is not just this body, this physical body, but our work for the Lord Jesus Christ. That we're building upon that one foundation, which is Jesus Christ. We don't walk by what we can see here but we walk by faith. Look, I love you all. I truly do. Rest in Him. Until next time, thanks for watching.